At the beginning of creation, Lucifer defiantly rebelled against God, grasping after his position. Now God the Son, though still fully God, had set aside all his visible glory and majesty to leave heaven and come to earth as a human being. Jesus must have appeared very vulnerable to Satan. If he could only entice Jesus to do his bidding, it'd be a great victory. From God's perspective, it was time to reveal something more about himself. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The desert here in question was almost certainly the Judean wilderness. It is a barren part of the world for sure, barren of trees, water, and people. It is an incredibly rugged mountainous region. Jesus took on the devil alone without any of the comforts of life. He had none of the encouragements that are the result of having friends present. He was alone with the devil under very rugged, trying conditions. Now, the Bible says Jesus had just completed a lengthy time without food. Although Jesus is God, he is also a real man with real physical needs. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Satan was suggesting that Jesus do something that everyone would understand, namely, take care of his physical well-being. It also seemed like a prime opportunity for Jesus to prove who he really was. If Jesus was God, then he had created the world simply by speaking it into existence. To turn stones into loaves of bread would be a simple matter. It would prove Jesus was God. But there was a catch. To do so, he would be following Satan's orders. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus responded to Satan by quoting the Bible, God's written word. He said that it was more important to follow God than to take care of physical needs. Now, this is a significant statement as many people are so concerned about this physical life that they ignore their spiritual well-being. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Okay, the story continues. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. The exact location where Satan took Jesus is uncertain, but it was most likely the southeast corner of the temple compound overlooking the Kidron Valley. The Jewish historian Josephus said the drop was 450 feet or 140 meters, which would have placed the structure in the time of Jesus significantly higher than it is right now. On the opposite hand, it could have been the southwest corner. Whichever the case, Either corner, even as they exist today, they are formidable heights. Anyway, Satan took Jesus to the highest point of the temple, and then he said, If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now the challenge was brazen. Prove it. Prove it that you're God's son. If God is truly your father, then he'll save you. Satan was quoting a passage found in the Bible, in the book of Psalms. Satan loves religion, and quoting the Bible is a favorite trick of his. The only problem was this. Satan was not quoting God's word accurately. He was selecting only the portion that suited his purposes. He had done this with Eve in the Garden of Eden, and now he was trying it on Jesus. Once again, Jesus answered Satan's temptation by quoting the Bible correctly. He didn't need to prove himself. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you. He said, if you will bow down and worship me. Once again, the exact mountain is unknown. But since it is identified as a very high mountain, 
we can presume quite safely that it was Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in the region of Israel, and from it you can truly see an incredible distance. Satan was offering Jesus all the people of the world if Jesus would only worship the devil. After all, wasn't that what Jesus wanted for people to follow him? What Satan did not mention was this. If Jesus worshiped Satan, then he would also be serving him. Worship and service always go together. You can't divide the two. But Satan's plot didn't work. Once again, Jesus quoted Scripture. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Satan had not succeeded in entrapping Jesus in his treacherous web of deceit. Jesus was above reproach, uncompromising in his resistance to temptation. Well, Satan retreated temporarily, but he was still determined to destroy Jesus. But from his perspective, not all was lost. He had succeeded in having John the Baptist thrown in jail. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake. Jesus made Capernaum his headquarters for a period of time. The ruins of the city still exist right here beside the sea, just as Scripture records. In the time of Jesus, the city was probably constructed completely of basalt, a black volcanic rock. The people made an income by manufacturing grinding or millstones of various sizes. Today, the ruins are dominated by a prominent synagogue made of white limestone. Now, after Jesus was tempted by Satan, he set up headquarters, as it were, right here in Capernaum. So we're going to be hearing more about this city. But before we finish talking about Satan, I want to look at one other important aspect of what the Bible says about the struggle between good and evil. You tell me something. You, well, if I say a word, I want you to give me back the equal opposite. For example, if I say good, you'll say bad. bad. Right, that's it. If I say fast, you say Slow. If I say hot, Cold. okay, tall, Short. soft, Hard. God. Bad. Some of you hesitated there. It's not quite that way. We often get mixed up in our thinking. We begin to think of Satan as the equal opposite of God. And this is not true. Satan is not all-knowing. Though the devil is very powerful, he is not all-powerful. And Satan is not everywhere present at one time, though as many demons may make it seem that way. Uh, the truth of the matter is this. The relationship between God and Satan is like this. Here's God, here's Satan. It's not an even way scale where here's God and here's Satan is going back and forth like this. So it's not an equal opposite. God is far more powerful than Satan, a created being. You know, Pa, we've just seen here that though Jesus was tempted, he didn't give in to temptation. He was perfect. That's right. Jesus never sinned. True and false prophets have come and gone, but none have claimed to be sinless. The Bible records the lives of many people who are either revealed as sinners or confessed their sinfulness, but Jesus never did. In fact, you know what? You can search the Scriptures in vain looking just for one reference where Jesus sinned or asked for forgiveness. And you know, I find it interesting to note that even those that were closest to Him, those who were the most likely to know of any character flaws, wrote that Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Well, Jesus' temptation was just one more way in which he identified with humanity. You know, when God finally judges all mankind, no one's going to be able to stand before him and say, God, you don't understand. You were born in a palace, I in dirt. You were never tempted, I was. How can you judge me when you never faced what I faced? <laughs> no. The Bible says that we don't have a God who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. 